Our first reading this morning is uh, actually different than what you have printed in your bulletin. Um, we will be reading from Psalm 40, verses 4 through 10, and you can find that on page 438 in your pew Bible. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after the lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not retrained my lips, as you know, Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You. Our readings today from the Old Testament, continuing with Psalm 40, verses 11 through 17. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond my number. My inequities have overtaken me and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs on my head and my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those be put to shame and disappointed together, altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, Aha! Aha! But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy. But the Lord takes thought of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Well, Joshua had planned to do a sermon called Wrestling with God. And he asked me to, if I wanted to, to read it or do one of my own. And after conversation, he decided he's going to preach whatever's in the bulletin this week, next week. Um, with the grace of God, he'll be cured, and uh, he'll be able to do that. So I had about 24 hours to, to think about how I would approach the subject, wrestling with God. And I thought, I don't think we're really wrestling with God today. Wherever we are, we've all been here before. What should we do? And of course, I'm speaking of the, the terrible things that we see among us today. We as a world civilization have been under a tremendous siege for our health and safety during most of the year 2020. We've looked around to both our friends and enemies for a solution to the current pandemic. This current threat on humanity is certainly not new to the world. Now, I hope this doesn't go sailing over everybody's head, because I thought about this a lot. Whatever you believe to be true about our current situation is more than likely accurate. Since you believe it to be so, therefore it's true. At least in your mind, it's true. In order to solve any problem in any realm, whether the problem is physical or mental or emotional, we all try to seek a remedy. 
But as the saying goes, we first have to stop the bleeding or the torment. If you believe that this worldwide pandemic is a message from the Lord that we need to get our act together as a world peoples, you're probably right. Or is this just a continuing evolution of the biological development of the world balance between man and nature? We're all certainly aware that there's more bugs than there are people by the millions. Or maybe you believe it's a giant conspiracy by one of our political enemies. That's highly unlikely because the whole world has been affected. Or maybe it's something we simply haven't thought of yet. Or maybe it's a combination of all of these thoughts that's probably closer to the correct answer. Regardless of how and why we are in this mess, it's our faith that the Lord will provide a solution and that should not be challenged. As in my own personal life, which like many of yours, has been fraught with a myriad of seemingly unsolvable situations, I've always held tightly to the belief that can be found in our scriptures. And that's the thought, the Lord will never give us any more than he thinks we can handle. Now you have to consider that on both sides of the coin. More than we can handle of bad things or more that we can handle of good things. Can we ever have too many good things? Starting with candy? money. Now that's an arguable point, both the good and the bad. There's some food for thought there. So what I did, I, I went looking through for some scripture and found some passages where the God has forced pestilence on the earth. We all know about locust swarms and the floods and the fires and the uh, hurricanes and the tornadoes and the earthquakes, all of those things show up in the Bible and they're generally regarded as God's getting a message to us. But I found some that name no cause for the disease. In Leviticus 13, there's, they deal with rashes and skin diseases and goes into great detail what should be done about it? There's a huge, long passage of various skin diseases and where they are on your body and what should happen and so on. Mostly, it was done by examination by the priest and his treatment of doing something, whether it's a lotion or a bath or, or whatever. But it's never talked about where they came from, where, what causes the disease. That wasn't, that wasn't a question. And then looked at Kings first, uh, first Kings, verse 17, chapter 17, verse 17. Elijah was reviving a very old boy from apparent death with just no explanation of the cause. The mother had come to Jesus and said, my son is, is dead, fix him. Jesus just held out his hand and touched him. Never addressed the fact what caused him to be dead. Then he went to 2 Kings. I found the story of a man who had leprosy, was simply told to go bathe in the Jordan River. He did, and got better. No mention of what caused it. In Mark 1, going to the New Testament, chapter 30, Mark relates to us the story of Simon's mother had a fever and was cured by Jesus simply touching her. No reason was given for the disease. Now some other passages state a known cause. In Kings the second, second Kings, fourth chapter, 38 to 40, Elisha returned to Gilal, Gilgal, excuse me, where there was a famine. He simply prepared a stew that they could eat 
by gathering unknown herbs from the field. It didn't work, and the people got sick. So he said, put flour in it. And miraculously, everybody got better. So at least they said it was a famine, obviously caused by bad food or something. We now recognize that maybe as bacteria or whatever, but they, they gave the cause and the, and the cure. Now, some other cures are proclaimed to be divine. In Samuel 5, verses 6 through 12, the Philistines had captured the Ark of God from Israel, and their entire population was riddled with body tumors. They tried moving from city to city, taking the Ark with them. Every city they went to, the city, whole city broke out with these body tumors. Only after they simply decided they'd better give it back to Israel with, of course, a sacrifice. There was some bloodletting and that sort of thing. But when the ark came back to Israel, all the tumors in all the towns went away. And in Numbers 16, verses 41 through 50, when the Israelite community grumbled, about, grumbled against Aaron and Moses, who were trying to lead them, the Lord simply placed a plague on them. And only after 14,700 of them had died, Aaron decided to make atonement. He stood between the people, Moses and God on this side, Aaron and the people on the other side, and he made atonement for them, standing between Moses and the Lord, asking for forgiveness. The Lord was obviously moved, and he granted forgiveness and a comprehensive study then of Deuteronomy will enlighten us on the relationship of disease to sin. Now I think you begin to see that while we are living in an unprecedented time in our century and our lifetimes, humanity has been there before. That knowledge in itself is not a whole lot of hope for us. Yeah, we've done it before. We've seen it before. Our ancestors have been through this. So what can we actually do about it? If you think about what the solutions of, of some of the examples I gave you, you will find that the most significant advances came to the people by using acquired collective knowledge. A lot of that came with the Age of Enlightenment. People learned to read and write. And their communication skills were brought forth with word of educational practices. The development of modern sciences bring forth extremely rapid solutions to what we are enduring this time around. We don't have to wait for 40 years for the plague to lift or earthly destruction if we use the knowledge that God has given us and we believe that he will provide for us. Bless you. We, we all know that vaccine, a vaccine for this particular pandemic will soon be readily available for all of us. Maybe the cure and the benefits that we did not know even nine months ago. The common sense things that we have been practicing have kept this problem at bay to a degree. Whether it's mask or distancing or hand washing, disinfectants, those are all scientific things that weren't here before. By simply practicing what we do know and faith in the Lord, do not give up the faith. He will provide for us. It's ironic that just about the time we all begin to feel in our hearts that we can see the light in the end of the tunnel, in, at the end of the tunnel for our current situation, our government goes into an internal hemorrhage on national television. Maybe this is another more or less shot upside the head by our Lord telling us that we need to get our act together before things get worse. I think we all know and believe the common sense solutions. 
be nice. Respect each other. Respect others and their opinions. Stay calm in the face of disagreements. Turn the other cheek if you have to. That's really hard to do. One that I found is, is really insidious and working on us, when none of us ever really want to admit this, but you know, in the face of a disagreement, the other guy is allowed to be right. Whether that's a football game, a disagreement about government, what we eat, where we go, the other guy has a right to be right. And if it's not going to make anything any better, don't say it or don't do it. Treat everybody like you want to be treated. Following the Ten Commandments, the Beatitudes, the Scout Oath, and our laws in general, behave like a responsible citizen and a responsible human being. We can find all of that right here. If we take the time to do it. Be generous and praise other people. Help anybody and everybody you can. Continue to vote in our democracy. So we all know there's a right way and a wrong way to solve disagreements. Terrorizing other people is not it. Our biggest tool in democracy is voting. Please pray for our country's world health and welfare and continue to pray for democracy and freedom every place. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Thank you very much.